on this episode of Still Loading, The Mightiest of Mics. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval, and today on the show, we are going to be exploring a, a game that's a personal favorite of mine, a game that not a lot of people talk about, it, at least not that in, in my circles. And I, my guest mentioned off mic that he has something to say about that, so I'm excited to hear. But uh, as soon as I started planning this episode, then a bunch of people mentioned that they've heard of this game. And of course, we are talking about the... Uh, Macintosh technically no longer exclusive, but at the time it was released exclusive. Uh, the Macintosh exclusive game Power Pete, later known as Mighty Mike. And joining me today is the if I if I remember your title correctly, the librarian of the the, the librarian of the Video Game History Foundation, Phil Salvador. Phil, how are you doing today? Hey there, thanks for having me. Doing all right, all things considered. Uh, happy to be here. Talk. It's really funny. Like when you invited me to this podcast, uh, you know, occasionally get you know invitations to podcasts. And when you mentioned Power Pete, it was like, okay, that's weirdly specific enough that I really want to be on this episode. So, <laughs> thank you so much for agreeing to come on. I, it was, so we have a mutual friend, Dan Greenberg, uh, mm-hmm. who I asked him. I was like, do you know anyone who knows anything about Power Pete? Because Mac gaming is such. You know, most people growing up in the 90s did a lot more PC gaming than Mac gaming, and Mac gaming was its own niche in and of itself. And uh, my me growing up, uh, my parents actually bought a Macintosh. I'm sure I'm I'm assuming it's one of the performers. I actually don't even know which one it is. They still have it. It's in the basement in my parents' house. Like I, I think it might even still work if uh, if <laughs> the high levels of moisture down there haven't completely ruined everything. Oof. But um, yeah, so I, I ha- this game was one of my first games that I ever played and uh, for one of the earliest memories for me growing up as a kid. So when I started getting into the podcasting sphere and like video game content creation and retro gaming and all this other stuff no one knew about this game no one ever talked about this game and so i was so happy when dan uh mentioned that you are a big mac gamer in general so for my listeners after that long preamble uh (laughs) tell everyone first off a little bit about yourself and b some of your personal history with mac gaming and power pete Yeah, of course. Uh, So like you said, uh, my current job right now, I'm the library director at the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, So I'm helping uh, with our archives of materials, helping catalog all the exciting things we've been collecting and working us towards uh, getting our digital library available for research. And that's just going to be all sorts of exciting video game history material. Uh, But that's kind of not why I'm here, though. Um, Prior to being at VGHF and still ongoing now, uh, I have a blog called The Obscuratory, where I revisit Mm -hmm. uh, older, unusual video games. And it's kind of the same thing uh, that you mentioned, where it's, you know, I had a lot of games growing up because I I also had a, a Macintosh. I had a Performa actually as well. I had an old Windows <laughs> computer and I played a lot of these kind of unusual shareware CD-ROM games. And it was uh, born out of kind of a, a confusion of, you know, seeing some of the early like game blogs and content creator folks, you know, kind of repeatedly mining the same terrain of like, you know, let's talk about Mega Man and Contra and Final Fantasy and thinking like, mm-hmm. well, there's this whole weird other world of stuff. And a big part of it for me was Macintosh games. So that was... I think when I started, one of the things I really wanted to set out to do was to focus more on Mac games. And I think we, we are seeing as emulation improves, as people start digging into some of the, the deeper corners of stuff, we're seeing more attention brought to this. Uh, I do have to mention, uh, I don't have it uh, immediately on hand, but uh, I want to mention Richard Moss's book, The Secret History of Mac Gaming, uh, which is a very, very thorough book about just all sorts of corners in uh, Macintosh game development, because it was this kind of separate community happening parallel to what was going on Mm -hmm. with PC game development and all that. It was this kind of self-serving, smaller audience that made these really unusual expressionistic games because Macintoshes could do, you know, high color graphics and sound before that was really as feasible on computers. Uh, So you ended up with 
you know, weird things like Power Pete coming along that were developed <laughs> by small independent teams. Power and for, and Power Pete. What blew me away about it now, like looking back, are the visuals for this game. I, I mean, I, I don't really have much to compare it to. I, but it came out. It came out on August eighth, nineteen ninety five, and it looks like uh like an enhanced sixteen bit game. Would you agree with that? I, I'm. Yeah, I, I think to to draw a comparison tech wise, because I assume folks listening to this podcast might be more familiar with what was happening in like the PC game space in 1995, mm-hmm. uh, that there weren't a lot of games that you know looked like uh, just like pulling a random example, like a PS One like side scrolling game or something like that. There wasn't a whole lot mm-hmm. like that on PCs. Um, Macintosh computers were generally speaking better at doing high color kind of smooth moving action oriented graphics uh multimedia stuff that that was generally earlier on in the 90s that was kind of their strong suit so you saw a lot more independent developers making games that were you know high color graphics at 640 by 480 resolution uh which was you know high resolution graphics for its time with digitized voices and sounds you saw that happening earlier on the mac so i think this fits into what was happening in the Mac game scene at that time, where there just was, they were just able to get more out of the computers, despite them technically not being, you know, as much of the game computers as I think DOS and Windows were becoming associated with at that point. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, the developer of this game, when you're, you know, you're talking, you were just mentioning how developers for Mac would able, were able to get a lot of high color, uh, artwork and a bunch of a lot of uh power out of the systems even though you weren't quite expecting it at the Mm -hmm. time and it was developed this game was developed by pangea software it was originally called power pete uh but that was actually forced on them by their publisher mac play and they hated it they absolutely (laughs) hated it it's funny i actually so this is my second attempt to do an episode on this game now the first episode did actually get released. It's actually, I want to say, episode two of the podcast, which you can't even listen to anymore because it's hidden on SoundCloud because of SoundCloud's garbage, like uh, data storage limits and stuff like that. I do plan on re-releasing it at, for the 10th anniversary of the show next year. I meant Lost to do episode. it this summer. Yeah, it's. And I'm not. I don't know how good it is. I haven't listened to it in almost a decade, and it was also once again second episode. So I, I've learned a lot since then. Oh, it's gonna, um, going back. It's going to be like all like staticky <laughs> microphone, like apologizing for missing the last. Like that's always what happens. Going back to like your second thing you publish, it's always going to sound like that. <laughs> uh, I my my luckily my audio was never awful, but. It was very much like you said, where you're always apologizing. I'm sorry I missed this date. I was I was going to release an episode last week. And that's how <laughs> the first like two years of my show were. <laughs> but you said this was your, your second attempt at doing this, which implies something happened or it wasn't a complete well, like what was what's the. Yeah, sorry. This attempt, I should say, attempt isn't the right word. This is my second go at gotcha. doing an episode okay. on Power Pete. So the first my first attempt slash go did actually get released. So I wouldn't say it's an attempt. OK, but, OK, sorry. This is uh so the first time, and I mean no shade towards my uh my co-host at the time, my one of my best friends, Justin, but he didn't have a personal history with Power Peter and Mighty Make, or nor did he have any really knowledge of Mac gaming general like you do, Phil. So mm-hmm. this is you know like years later, I'm redoing some of my old episodes that I that I feel like I could do better on, and this really fits into that. And uh, growing up, I, I played this a ton. My dad and I actually would play this, and he was the type that found it hilarious that you were this big, buff, manly dude rescuing fuzzy bunnies. Uh, that's <laughs> that's the whole premise of this game, uh, where you play as Power Pete, who is an action, who is an action figure. I'm sorry, Mighty Mike. Uh, the reason, by the way, that they wanted that they forced them to change it was because they were worried that the name Mighty Mike was too close to Mighty Mouse and they didn't want to be sued. <laughs> and I, I do I do want to say for the record, I looked this up because I saw that in your notes and I thought that sounds like apocryphal, like something someone would make up. And I checked and there is a Reddit post that links to the uh, no longer existing Pangea software message forums where the game's creator said that directly. So that is, I wor- actually word have of, word uh, of God on that. <laughs> it, it's I, I can do you one better. I have email correspondence from him from oh. when I did the episode 10 years ago. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, okay. That's where Wait. I got most of this information from. 
I just as a historian, I'm always a stickler for making sure like sources are correct. So like, I just want to say like, yes, this is accurate for folks listening. This is actually what happened. I appreciate that. And no, I'm, I, uh, you're, you're, I appreciate that for on a number of levels. A, I do try to be historically accurate. B, um, what is it? I, I did a recently, it just kind of reminds me of this. I did a recently, I was at retro world expo, uh, and I did a panel yeah. on the history of James Bond and video games. And there was something, it was, it was a minor, I shouldn't say minor, but it was something that did that I will need to correct. And thankfully I didn't record it. So it's not like I published it and it ended up being wrong, but no, uh, no, <laughs> exactly. Well, one of the, pe- one of the people from one of the staffers at retro world pulled me aside very politely. That makes it sound like it was something like it was a problem. He was so nice and polite. His name was, Oh shoot. He didn't even give me his last name. I think it was Ryan, but he, uh, the, the Atari 2600 game for James Bond, uh, the 007 game on there, th- I said it was a game that it it very much screams that it was a game that wasn't meant to be a James Bond license and it uh, they just slapped the Bond license on it. That's not actually historically, that's not true. Uh, he went into a very detailed explanation about how Parker Brothers owned the copyright or owned the license for a James Bond video game and the first developer that they tried to hire it basically went bankrupt and so they couldn't finish the game and so they brought in a bunch of like almost like personal friends and created a company from i don't know if it was for this game specifically or they had created a game company prior and so parker brothers was like here do this in like three weeks or something like that so mm. it did intend to be a bond game but it was just done under an insane time crunch anyway. gotcha yeah, I mean, and, 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 and as a sidebar, like that's kind of one thing we're concerned about. The Video Game History Foundation is like so many things just kind of exist as trivia in the ether. And like you always have to bring it back to the original source and figure out like, well, why is that information out there? Uh, so in this case, yes, Power Pete, Mighty Mouse, the whole thing accurate is the point <laughs> and uh another thing that he wrote to me in, in his email was pangea hated the name change besides the name change excuse me they also hated the box art none of the characters look like they do in the game and he specifically cited there's a kangaroo on the box which never appears in the game at all <laughs> so he i was kind of bummed when i reached out to him i was hoping he'd like offer some more information but i also uh he, he only gave like two or three fun facts but i wanted to include them nonetheless um and uh pangea did get the rights back to the game in 2001 which is when they finally were able to rename it mighty mike and one of the cooler aspects of this which you can find now online completely for free in 2021 they released the source code for not just this game but a bunch of their titles and you can download this game a fan of these games took the source code and ported it over to modern PCs and not just this game. They also did Bugdom, Chromag Rally, uh, Automatic, Nanosar 1 and 2, which I've never played any of these, mind you. I, I've only ever played Mighty Mike. Have you ever mm-hmm. played any of these other uh, Pangea Soft games? Uh, I, I had an interaction with a couple of them, and this is actually I want to jump a little bit ahead in the notes to talk about this because this is kind of a funny weird story. Um, so. I used to volunteer at the video game event out in Maryland that uh, Daniel Greenberg, who you mentioned earlier, we would both go to it. And uh, they had like an, you know, kind of an old like classic computer room. They had this beautiful section with like all these old iMacs of all different colors. And the only games they had on them were Chromag Rally and Bugdom, <laughs> which were two of the 3D games by Pangea Software. And I always wondered yep. like, well, what the hell? Why, why would, are these the only games you have on any of these computers? <laughs> and it's because they were bundled with some iMacs and with OS X. Like that was, they were able to get them bundled with Mac computers. Uh, and you mentioned in the notes, I didn't realize this, that PowerPete was also bundled with Mac OS 7 computers and Performa computers. And so what we said earlier about uh, how, you know, you talked to a lot of folks who were like, oh yeah, I remember PowerPete. I think the only reason we're talking about it is because Pangea software was good at getting their game out like that. Um, I played it not even, it didn't come bundled with a computer. I just played it on a demo disc. And I think they oh. were they were just effective. At, I mean, obviously they were going through, you know, Mac play for some of this, but I think either them or Mac play, or I guess combination of both because, you know, Chromag and uh, Bugden were their own thing. They were just good at getting them out in different outlets. I think that was part of like the shareware distribution model. Like you had to be able to hawk your game in different places and get it included on discs and make an easy pathway to getting the full game unlocked. And I think they were effective. Like it obviously made an impression and enough people played it that those folks like they're still around, right? 
Uh, so I think mm-hmm. I think that's why folks remember it. I think it's the only reason we're talking about it today is because they were good at distribution back then. Yeah, the and speaking of it being pre-installed on or packaged with these computers, that's how I played it. It was packaged with our Performa back mm-hmm. in like the mid '90s. I mean, I, I ended up playing a bunch of other games. Like I remember, you know, Star Wars. Uh, I think we had X Wing. We also had. Oh my gosh, what is it? It's the freaking Rebel Assault 1 and 2. Those were stupid hard games, at least for me <laughs> as a kid. But anyway, I I, I don't want to go. I, I can go off on tangents. So I'm going to avoid that. To dive into the game, oh, actually, before we dive into the game, do you have any personal memories of Power Pete? Did we talk? I feel I felt like we kind of talked about it kind of like around. We kind of skirted around it a little bit. But do, did you have any personal memories of it? Or was it something that you kind of found later on as an adult? Uh, it was one of those games I played back when I had a computer as a kid, just having a demo disc. I think it, I had just like a Mac play demo disc that had a bunch of things, including Power Pete, and I played through it uh, enough to get far enough in that I couldn't get any further because I was like five or six years old. I wasn't good at video <laughs> games. Uh, but yeah, another one, I think a lot of games in that era you just encountered through demo discs or shareware cities, even if you didn't upgrade them to the full version. And so I think... I assume Power Pete had a lot of people who got similar impressions of it back in the day that way. Um, I do want to say before we move on, uh, since you mentioned there are the you know the free versions for modern platforms, uh, if folks listening to this want to play Power Pete, I would say go to those ones right away. Uh, for this podcast, uh, I went back and you know fired up the original version of Power Pete in an old Macintosh emulator, and oh, that wow. thing that thing is really finicky. I want to say um, it's. Games back then were, you know, often dependent on computer speed in some ways that kind of mess with them. And it was very hard to eat to get it threading the needle between running way too fast and running a little too slow. Even at the right speed, it was a little choppy. Uh, the modern versions run great. They're smooth. It's wonderful. Uh, I would say just go ahead and play those ones immediately. Normally, I'm a big proponent of like, go back and experience it as it was at least once to get the context for how it was played. You're not missing anything. Just go for the version you can get on itch.io. Just go for it. And the guy who does it, uh, the last name is Jorio. They're from France. I don't know. I I was actually hoping to get them on the podcast, not for this specifically, but just in general, because the uh, Brian Greenberg, who is the guy who was the head of Pangea Software, who worked on this game, he mm-hmm. I've seen on his like social medias that he has directly shouted out uh, Jorio, or I'm, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing their name. I have no I have no frame of reference, mm-hmm. but uh, they he shouted them out because they it feels like once the source code was released, it seems like they worked directly with him to help them port these games over to modern system. I can't say that for certain. That is a speculation. That is not gospel or fact. But just from seeing some of the social media posts between Greenberg and Jorio, I, I feel like there is not necessarily an official collaboration, but it seems like he was a lot more open with some of the technical stuff than maybe he would be with other people type of thing. I mean, if there's a fan who comes along and it's like, hey, I will port your game to modern systems for you for fun. I mean, yeah, you want to cheer that guy on. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> it, and not only just Power Pete, like I mentioned, Nanosaur, Billy Frontier. I, I have not tried any of these yet, but I do plan on really digging into this. And I, I, like I said, I wanted to reach out to Jorio and see if I could speak to them. But the only way I could find to message them is through sending a $3 tip on Kofi or Kofi or whatever coffee whatever it's how i don't how is it I've, I've never heard it pronounced out loud i don't know Ko-fi. i know right I've, I've said ko-fi internally but i have no frame of reference for that at all yeah i'm not sure uh, i will go ko-fi we'll just say it uh, we'll say it declaratively um sure yeah so i might i might uh <laughs> i might maybe i'll send a tip and just ask like hey i would love to speak to you on a podcast we'll see how that goes uh, <laughs> anyway uh, the, the, what is power P, you know, we've kind of talked about this game and a little bit of its development, not, talked not, about big, not, big, big, big muscly guy going around rescuing rabbits. Got kind of like a, <laughs> like a persona for Kanji energy going on. 
<laughs> and uh, Power Pete also kind of, I, I mean, it came out, what year did Toy Story come out? 93? I think Toy Story also came out in 95. So it's just, I thought of this too. Like, Something in the air. Yeah, for reference for folks. So in this game, you are playing as an action figure named Power Pete, who's got a big Buzz Lightyear-esque chin, who's going around yep. rescuing toys <laughs> in a toy store. Happened to come out the same year as Toy Story. Seems to be a complete coincidence. That's yeah. I mean, that would just be that's way too coincidental. I feel like there is. I anyway, I, I can't imagine there was much overlap between Pangea Software and Pixar, but you never know at the same time. You never know uh, the overall premise of the game. We talked about Power Pete, this action figure rescuing bunnies, but the actual <laughs> I'm not going to read the whole <laughs> thing because it's a couple paragraphs long. But uh, in the instructions, the instruction booklet, it gives a little a little one page summary of the story and I'll read a, a snippet of it here. Toy Mart has closed for the evening. The clerks have long since turned off cash registers and the midnight janitor has left. Suddenly the store comes alive as dolls, action figures and game pieces jump to their feet. Within moments, cities are formed in the bargain bin. Racetracks become islands of action surrounded by a sea of onlooking toy robots in the clown department. I first off, what toy store is a clown department we'll get into that in a second you know uh, the clown the, department yeah <laughs> you know as you do uh, I, <laughs> that when i was reading that i'm like clown department the fuck kind of toy store has a clown oh, well, that's, it, that's it, like nightmare inducing for kids honestly it's the kind of thing that i think you could just like say and just move past and it doesn't occur to you until like five minutes later it's like yeah they're in the toy store they go to the clown area and there's all the clowns <laughs> and, and it, but it's not until later it's like oh wait that's not a thing that's not a concept on earth uh so <laughs> we're, we're rolling with it clown department <laughs> clown department and thousands of insane clowns initiate a massive pie fight throughout all of the department's life arises now before i continue on with the next paragraph and like i said i won't read the whole thing there's only one more paragraph i'm going to read this first one posits that not only is there a clown department phil but these clowns also know how to cook because they initiate a massive pie fight and i can't imagine the pies that would have been packaged with these toys were real pies so well, they're, they're from the pie department, obviously. Oh, that's uh, there we go. How, how could I have been so dumb? There's a pie department, clearly. <laughs> just under, separate sub departments for everything, which actually in the game is like slightly true, which we'll get into. <laughs> but... <laughs> I love this fictional world that they've set up in, the, in Toy Mart, the generic name of Toy Mart. Uh, the next paragraph here. Suddenly there is a commotion in the doll department. One of the cages in the stuffed animal zoo has broken open. Hundreds of fuzzy buddies, even though you only rescue like what? There's three permission, three level or sorry, five permission, 15 times five. So you're looking at less than 100. <laughs> That's I, I don't feel like mathing that right now. Uh, well, 75. Is that right? Let's, let's just say like 100. Some levels have more. Yeah. Let's wrap it up and say 100 bunnies total. 100 bunnies. But in this one, they say that, that hundreds, uh, you know, okay, fair enough. But hundreds of fuzzy bunnies hop out of their cage and scatter. The fuzzy bunnies, with their limited intellect, do not realize the danger they are in. The new metropolis of Toy Mart can be a very dangerous place for fuzzy bunnies to wander alone. And without help, they stand little chance of surviving until morning. And the peaceful inhabitants of the doll department cry out for the fuzzy bunnies to return, but to no avail. What will they do? What will become of the fuzzy bunnies? And then in comes Power Pete with the quote, I will help you. And I'm not going to read the rest of it, but or Mighty Mike. I, I just call him Power Pete because that's how I remember it as. It, it has more punch. I don't know. Power Pete just sounds better than Mighty Mike. I'm, I know. Thank you. I was worried that was just me, and I know they intended it to be Mighty Mike, but I, I kind of like Power Pete more. And it, it has a little bit of parallel with like Power Macintosh computers. I don't know. It just it fits. I think it works better. I, I agree. I definitely agree. And I <laughs> I love the premise of this and how melodramatic this shows in the in the game, because every time you start a level, you see like Pete, like they have this really cool graphic, you know, with some kind of like butt rock music playing in the background and you <laughs> power Pete is looking dramatic as he's walking into the next section of the toy store. But if you die or if you quit, they give you this equally dramatic exit screen of, you know, power Pete falling over his legs, kind of falling apart. And it just, it's basically makes you feel guilty for even putting the game down. It's pretty, it's pretty hardcore. 
I mean, this is Pete's life. He's taking this very seriously. I mean, for us, it's obviously it's toys, but for him, like it's like Buzz Lightyear. It's his entire world. And they, those bunnies, man, they need to be saved. I mean, they they're going to get mixed into that pie department, and who knows what who's going to eat them by accident? Yeah, I think it's really funny that there's an implication that certain toys in the toy store are just inherently evil and like will destroy <laughs> you. Like, I think in Toy Story, like the toys to an extent get along like there's villains like there's zerg or whatever but like there's not like oh don't go into that corner of like andy's room the toys will literally murder you like the sheep and the dinosaur get along they're all kind of on the same team but this one it's like those bunnies are doomed they went to like the dinosaur area you will never see them again unless power pete saves them and uh, you know in toy story they at least give their their evil toys the characteristics of you know like the stinky prospect or Pro- stinky pete uh the reason he's evil is because he's always been the shelf toy and never got to feel, was never given a child's love, you know, never got to be played with as a toy is supposed to type of thing. And so he's bitter about it. So now that he has his chance to actually feel some type of adoration, then he, you know, that's why he's evil. And they do the same thing in Toy Story 3 and so on and so forth. Um, now, in this one, toys are born sociopathic <laughs> unless they are from the doll department. That, that, that I found it odd that they specifically mentioned that the doll department are, is peaceful, the peaceful inhabitants of the doll department. So apparently every other department in this toy mart, in this toy store, is just raging all the time. I, I think it's one of those cloud department things you just don't read too much into. Uh, I think you just, you just <laughs> got to roll with it. <laughs> I, I just one of my favorite things to do in stuff like this, you know, the story really isn't meant to be taken seriously, but I always love looking at the story and taking it seriously just to be like, if you extrapolate, if you extrapolate this, what does this really mean in, in like some actual context? Well, it, it, and I just it has, find it so amusing. Yeah, it has the funny fortune of having come out at the same year as the thing that did take its premise extremely seriously and kind of mm-hmm. the rules and limits of it. So, uh, yeah, this this is this is more like like i don't know ikari warriors in a toy store is a little closer to kind of what we're going for with this one <laughs> definitely definitely i i also read somewhere on like wiki i think it was on wikipedia but i don't remember someone classified the story the story of this as power pete is the most popular toy in this toy store and the reason why all the toys try to attack him is because they're jealous of him which made a lot more sense than what was written in the manual but i don't <laughs> i don't know where they got that from or if the manual changed yeah i don't have a basis for that i power pete's the only one with a gun i think if a toy <laughs> ran into your department like holding an actual shotgun i think that would you would yeah you would attack him like sure. i mean to be fair it's a suction cup gun but still it's a gun <laughs> in toy I, he, world that might as well he, be a shotgun. he, ha- he has a tri- I forget what they call it officially but he has a triple barrel okay sorry it's a gumball blaster excuse me but he has a triple barreled gumball blaster it's a shotgun like yep i they actually so uh, and speaking of weapons well I, I yeah we'll talk about the weapons because we'll talk about the gameplay here and then we'll go into the some of the levels what I love about Power Pete. What really made this game stick out to me was this was one of the first games where that I played where you were given more than just two or three weapons or two or three. I mean, for lack of a better term, power ups. That's essentially what your weapons are in this Mm because you unlock them once you find ammo for them. So it might as well be a power up that you have limited use until you get more ammo because they are all weapons or guns. And there are so many in this game. There's a total of 14 and some of them are just wild. Like you, you have, uh, you have the, the, the first weapon you get is the suction cup gun. That's your base weapon. I, I believe it's infinite ammo on that too. I don't think you ever will run out of ammo, but it's also the weakest weapon in the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you also get a rock, <laughs> just rock, uh, a musket, a flamethrower, uh, I love how in the manual, though, they put Summer Fun trademarked Backyard Flamethrower is the official title of the flamethrower. Got to have always elaborate weapon names. Uh, I'm a fan of the fact that because uh, there's also you get weapons themed to each level you go to. And uh, mm-hmm. in the candy level, which we'll get into the weirdness of the candy level, uh, you get a tube of toothpaste as your weapon, just squirting <laughs> toothpaste on your sugar enemies, which like I think that's honestly what stood out to me the most going back to the game is that it's having a lot of fun with its premise like this is a it's a colorful game like even your weapons like the suction cup gun like it's not just like you know like a 
uh, like black gun or whatever. It's like it's like multicolored, like Nerf colors, big pink things glued mm-hmm. to the side of it. Uh, it is a bright, colorful, animated game with big characters that make wacky cartoon sound effects. Like they have fun with the idea of a an action game that takes place in a toy store. Like they they are. I don't want to say they're like a kid in a toy store because that just seems like tautological, but like they are having (laughs) fun with the arsenal of what's available, like just being able to throw in different settings and characters and weird items and all that. Yeah. And I mean, you can you can actually see that fun, not to bring it back to the manual, but you can see that fun in how they write the weapon descriptions and how they kind of characterize everything in this. So, for example, the toothpaste gun, clean up your enemies, pun intended, short range, fairly powerful, but doesn't work on everything. And, you know, it, it's not just like a it, they don't go into it just writing off a list of like, oh, it's, you know, power level five and, you know, range of 12 or something like that. They they have this fun description of it, like the 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 summer fun, the trademarked summer fun backyard flamethrower it reads fire real red hots or sorry fire real red hots like red hots is like a is a noun in this instance whoops what's that still doing on our shelves this toy was supposed to have been recalled but if but it uh recalled but oh, this doesn't make any sense but in a few boxes were that, that's what it was supposed to be but a few boxes were over, overlooked in the mess following this year's christmas rush too dangerous for the kids but perfect for your purposes <laughs> and, and also just like they have fun with what the weapons do and even in just like the function they have in the game itself like you mentioned earlier like the toothpaste gun doesn't work on everything like different weapons work better on different things like there are like one of the weapons you get uh earlier on is a musket gun like i just i don't know why it's a musket in the toy store but okay <laughs> yeah but like <laughs> The first level you're in is the prehistoric toy, toy aisle. And there's big dinosaurs and uh, things bouncing around. And like your weaker weapons don't work on them. You have to use the musket to like hunt the big game. So there's this kind of mm-hmm. funny like matching what weapon you're using to the scenario you're in. Like they have, they have a lot of fun with the premise, a lot more than I, I, I don't know, than I would expect out of something just being like an action run and gun game even but even with the enemy variety within those levels too like it, it for like well we, we we've kind of danced around the levels a little bit but that in my opinion it makes an argument that it's a well-designed game where the levels flow into the game design in an interesting way where the weapons the new weapons that you get match the theme of each world that you end up going to and there's a total of five worlds which with three levels per world and the first one the one we've been talking about right now is prehistoric plaza and that's filled with dinosaurs and cavemen and uh like uh, there's oh my gosh like uh, turtles these prehistoric turtles later on that are peaceful but you can kill them and get a ton of jawbreakers which jawbreakers think of them like mario coins almost where if you collect enough of them you get uh a level you get more level more lives excuse me and but in the, in this first section, you start off with a suction cup gun. You get a rocket or a rock, excuse me, not a rocket. You get a musket. You get a flamethrower. You get the double barreled gum, gumball blaster, um, and eventually you get a triple barrel <laughs> one. But I don't rem- I don't think that's in the first. Um, I don't believe that's in the first section. It might be, but it, it's, it's in there. You just got to find it uh, to okay. somewhere. But but yeah, but even like even beyond like the you know the enemies and the theming, like they have a lot of fun with the elements in the like the world you're in, even if it's not, they're not unique. Uh, so some of it is like in the prehistoric area, there are tar pits. And if you step in the tar pits, you die, but also like the areas around the tar pits are just kind of mucky. So you walk through them more slowly, but then they mm-hmm. also just do things like, uh, you know, it is prehistoric. So there's jungle trees. So enemies will dash out of the trees and you can't really see them. So you have to kind of navigate yeah. through the jungle carefully. Uh, but even just things like, uh you know every level the main kind of hook is you have to find a key to open a door and they try to theme the keys really neatly so in the prehistoric world it's like you get like a like a a crudely fashioned prehistoric weapon is your key and you like smash down a wall to break through it's like even the common gameplay elements they have fun re-theming for whatever world you're in like they clearly were having fun with the setting they were working with and farther down and one not, not to jump too far ahead but like in the fun house level that your tickets or sorry, i just gave it away your keys are tickets because you're at a circus you're at a carnival so what do you get at carnivals tickets to go on rides so in order to get through their giant creepy clown doors but to get through the doors 
you have to give a ticket in order to gain entrance to gain admittance to it. Kind of a cool idea uh, to fit the theme in, like what you like you were saying. Yeah, and I think it's a real credit to the designers of this. Uh, I think with a lot of shareware titles back in the day, where like you would have a demo and then you know get the rest of the game by paying X amount of money. I think there was a tendency. I don't think this was sh- I, no, I don't think this was shareware specifically. I think this was they were distributed a demo of the game. But I think there was a tendency to front load the games a little bit with the good content. Uh, not to get into a debate about like what the best episode of Doom is, for instance, but thinking about like <laughs> but thinking about like DOS games I enjoy that were shareware. Where, you know, the first shareware episode would have all these elaborate cutscenes and features, and then the second and third ones would just be like, here's some levels. But they didn't half ass any of this. Like every single world in this has a unique theme and hook to it, and unique enemies that behave differently. Like they went all out on making sure that every world in this offered something different. 100%. And the they even they even went down to like it's one of those things where you, when if you're only playing the game without seeing the manual manual you're only getting really half the experience because they they put a lot of attention into even just naming these enemies so for example the cavemen they're not just cavemen they're nongo the neanderthal when ticked off these toys will throw bones <laughs> at you it's it's only fair after all you're shooting at them uh, not to worry though they're made out of cheap plastic so breaking them doesn't take much just one shot should do the trick if you can hit them they're smarter than they look uh and dino eggs radical rex like i'm not going to read every single thing but <laughs> hold on hold the damn phone triceratops tom that's the best name i've ever heard that's a pretty good name for a triceratops but yeah they're they're making them action figures uh yeah. I, I i don't know i think you know a lot of games they would you know write the manuals afterwards so who knows that that was just them having fun afterwards or if they like had mapped out like we got all these action figures we got to make up these fake product like i don't know how they designed it but either way they were they were having fun with it which i mean it's, it's all you want from something like this right if you have a fun premise make it colorful and have fun with the characters and have fun with the sound which we haven't even talked about that's another interesting aspect of it um that you 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 mentioned in the notes and i want to make sure we talk about is that uh there's a lot of audio in this uh and that, yes. that sounds like a weird thing to say but there's a lot of like voiceovers for characters like the cavemen go unga bunga and a little speech balloon pops out above them and uh Power P has a bunch of catchphrases. He goes around and you know he sees a bunny and shouts, "Don't worry, I'll save you." Uh, and there's a lot of that, uh, and it repeats a lot. But uh, mm-hmm. but it's charming. It's uh, I hate using that word because it means almost nothing anymore in terms of game criticism. But it's again, they were having fun with the premise and with the world they had created. Like even if the rules of the world don't make a lot of sense, they're they're rolling with it. And the world, the rules of the world don't need to make sense because it's in a toy store that doesn't yeah. exist anyway. So it, exactly. it, they, they kind of, they, you know, rules be damned. It just, just makes some fun world. Now, the, the, the point I wanted to make about the sound, I actually, I don't know what my opinion is of it. I know I wrote in the notes just literally like two or three words. I just said music sounds, uh, music and sounds get old fast. That's all I wrote. But the, the thing I struggle with in my own, like trying to form an opinion and trying to seriously think about it is I don't know if I like the music because it's nostalgic or if it's actually good. Cause I, I think the individual tracks are fine. I, I, I feel like I like them more because of my nostalgia for it, but there's no variety in, in within them. Like there's one song pretty much for each of the five worlds and it just repeats over and over and over again. Well, to give some additional thoughts on this, uh, I think it varies a lot per song. Uh, it's in the style of like, you know, an older video game where it's a 15 second music loop, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And some of the ones like the prehistoric world music, uh, I think holds up a lot better because it's a little more intricate. There's kind of fun drum patterns to it and some interesting melody lines, yes. even though it's very repetitive. Uh, by comparison, the candy world level two, the music is just this like oompa of like do, 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 do. Do, 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 like over and <laughs> over, and it just drills into your brain. And so it varies a lot per level, I would say. Um, but I think the, I would agree with that. But I think, like any older game music, the ones where they, you know, did some more intricate patterns so you don't notice it looping as much, uh, I think are more enjoyable versus the ones where it's clearly just like 10 seconds of noodling around looped over and over again. <laughs> and that's, I, I, I think you're 100% right because they're, they're, 
I guess to list them all off now so we we can kind of talk about them as they come up throughout our conversation. The five mm-hmm. worlds are Prehistoric Plaza, Candy Cane Lane, Fairy Tale Trail, Magic Fun House, and the Bargain Bin, or just Bargain Bin. And Prehistoric Plaza, I'm with you. This the music for Prehistoric Plaza is really good, the especially the percussion in it. Candy Cane Lane's kind of eh fairy tale trail, I think, is the worst of all of them. Uh, not only because the music is meh, but did you in your replay of it? Did you get up to Fairy Tale Trail? I got into it, but kind of stopped midway through. So that one didn't have a chance to like, like looking at the sun and you get the image burned in your eyes. Like I didn't get that far with the music on uh, Fairy Tale Land, unfortunately. Well, it's not even necessarily just the music; it's the sound in general. So you mentioned before, you know, the cavemen in the first world and prehistoric plaza go unga bunga or something like that. And power mm-hmm. people always say, you know, like, don't worry, I'll save you or something. There's always Take some that, cool. you fiend. Take that, you fiend. Um, in fairy tale trail, you will period like they, they do a great job at theming the enemies for each of these worlds. It's all fairy tale based. And in fact, so much so that in the manual, when it lists it lists all the enemies for each world in, you know, in prehistoric plaza, they just call them the bad toys, candy cane lane, they call them toys gone rotten, kind of a play off the whole, you know, sugar and teeth thing, I guess. In um... fairy tale trail, they're called Grim with two M's, Grim Adversaries. Makes sense with the whole fairy uh, tales. Fairy tale yeah. thing. Well, my least favorite aspect of this entire thing is Little Miss Muffet. Little Miss Muffet, who sits on her tuffet eating her curds and whey, uh, has spiders under her. You know, she sits on a spider who, the, the whole nursery rhyme thing. Yeah, well, I, I knew it at one point very well, but. Oh my God. So if you, so what she is, she doesn't move. She's stationary. She's sitting on, sitting on her tuffet in the middle of everywhere. There's like 60 Miss Muffets throughout this freaking place. And if you get close to her, she stands up and this ear piercing nails on a chalkboard scream comes out of your speakers and spiders start chasing you. And doesn't matter if you're expecting it, because if you don't, sometimes you don't even see her on screen yet and you just hear this blood curdling scream and you just poop oh your pants. Oh my God. It's awful. I was not, I did not get that far into that world. I was not aware of that. Uh, I'm going to listen to that sound effect right now. <laughs> oh God. If I can load it up in VLC. Uh, I well, you know what? It's not playing in VLC right now. So I think maybe I'm spared, but man, that sounds really unpleasant. Uh, that's a really it, weird sound design choice. It is not pleasant in the slightest. Um, I overall actually like the visual aesthetic of Fairy Tale oh, Trail. Oh God, sorry, I just got it to play. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> That's horrible. Oh, my God. <laughs> it scares me shitless every time, man. Every single time I play it. it, it Why would they I, do that? <laughs> and they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And they if you stay on screen, say you take out all the spiders, they will sit back down after a little while. And then they'll just get up again and do it all over again. Maybe no spiders will come out, but they'll still scream again. So it's this perpetual nope. scream. Mm. Mm, mm, no, not a fan of that. Man, no, that's that's awful. a yeah. Every I I was fine with some of the repetitive noises earlier because it's just you know it's a couple monsters that make a little like ha 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 noise or something. But uh, that that's a kind of <laughs> crossing a line. Oh my god, it's one of the worst moments of the game in my opinion, and it's uh, that sound effect has been etched into my brain into my ears for the rest of my life it's it's awful but to get back to what you were saying before about all the different things they added to all these different levels mm-hmm. um each, each one has its its own unique theme like we said with all the different uh things one thing i i love about them though is it feels like there's something i don't know how to put my finger on it but it's like each each world feels so unique and not just because of the visuals i also feel like in the way that the levels are designed itself like the level layout feels very unique to each one so candy cane lane it's basically a maze of gun of gumdrops and like gingerbread and stuff like that and it's a lot of having to dodge a lot of little candy bits so you can't move quickly through that world because there is so many obstacles fairy tale trail you are exploring castles Magic Funhouse 
is they take the fun out of it. It's one of the, <laughs> I, I actually don't hate the individual levels. And in my, in my replay of it, this is where I got to the third level of this before our recording session. The, like I said, there's three levels in each world. The second level of the magic fun house, there's these air vents that you can ride on. And it's the second level is just a giant maze. And it's one of those mazes. Like remember in like uh, Pokemon red and blue, where you would stand on one of those things and would propel oh, you and you, yeah. you have no control. Really? This is a little bit, it's, it's very much like that, but you actually can control how, how power Pete moves. So, for example, say the air vents are shooting you straight down. You can't go back up, but you can, as you're going down, if you see a path off to the left or to the right, you can guide Power Pete to those paths, either left, right, or down. But it's still a maze. So since you're constantly moving, you have to essentially do the same thing over and over and over again until you memorize the layout of the maze. And it's tricky because there's five bunnies there, and some of them, there's there's some nasty ones. I remember as a kid, this took me forever. Yeah, I remember there's a level like that in Candy Cane Lane. That's the name of the world, right? Candy Cane, yeah, mm-hmm. Candy Cane Lane. Um, they they do a good job, I think, kind of figuring out what type of content they're going to put in what level. Um, the prehistoric world, I think, was interesting because uh, when I first started playing it, the the comparison in my mind was like, oh, this is almost kind of maybe gauntlet esque in the way that it's like these. Mm-hmm. It's it's maze like, but not like a traditional maze. It's like rooms that are connected to each other. You're kind of moving around semi non linearly to get through. Um, I think it, it was well done like that. And then yeah, going to the candy cane stage, it's a little more maze like. There are actually some maze sections. There is a like conveyor belt esque area, but it's because you're caught in a river of what I think was chocolate or milk chocolate or something like that something chocolate like milk. that something like chocolate milk yeah um i think they did a good job kind of changing what type of levels you're encountering based on the world you're in which i think again shows the care they put into this um the the vent thing sounds frustrating but i feel like that's kind of an inherent thing when you make like a magic or fun house based stage is there's just inherently going to be some bullshit like that because you're trying to like spring tricks on people and that's that's what that gets interpreted as when you're doing the levels but um I appreciate their willingness to mix it up. I appreciate they didn't just do the same type of level over and over across the entire game. They tried to make something that matched the stages. Um, I never got as far as the bargain bin. I don't know what is in that level, but it sounds like it's chaotic because it's it's the bargain bin. I I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if they try to design the levels around that theme in a meaningful way. It's uh, it's very like checkered, quite literally, like you see like checker patterns a lot in the background. There are little toy car racetracks. So if you're standing on the racetrack, you will get hit as the car does its loop. So you have to be careful not to be on there when the cars are driving by. There are these weird like I think they're meant to be slinkies because they, they move in the in an arc like a slinky does. But instead of going downstairs, mm-hmm. it just stays on the same level. Um, I'm trying to actually see what do they say everything is in the bargain bin. They don't even tell you in the so in every in every level or every world in the manual, it gives you a very detailed layout of all the different enemies you face. But uh, the bargain bin, it just says, let the buyer beware. That's right. On special today only, survive four levels, get one free. The catch is no toy ever banished to these sales racks has ever returned. And well, er, I didn't exactly make it all the way through the, this blasted clown's territory myself. In other words, there's no clues I can give you. The last few missing fuzzy bunnies are lost somewhere in this chaotic ret red tag blue light nightmare, and you're completely on your own. It was nice knowing you, kid. I mean, actually, looking, I'm looking at a screenshot now, and yeah, the levels seem very chaotically open ended. I see a like a what appears to be like a hockey trading card used as like a prop at one point. <laughs> like that's kind of fun. That it's just like, all right, here's the mishmash of random toy stuff in a chaos level with no particularly strong theming. It's like you know what? That's kind of fun if you're going to do a level like that. Like I, I appreciate that they had the they resisted the urge to do that for the entire game. That they just had, that's kind of the final area. That's neat. I think that shows, uh, if not good design, then at least, I don't know, intentional design on their part to like make sure they're de- like designing around a theme. That's, uh, I think, it's a, a good sign. I agree. And throughout all five of these levels, we've we've touched on the weapons before. And I'm, I'm not going to list all of them. Like I said, there's pie, or I can list at least a few, a few of them. Pies, <laughs> some, rubber some band the weird shooters. Ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I do like the the manual's description for pies. It says, "Finally, your chance to splatter the clowns on your own terms." <laughs> Just, oh, the the yeah. the flavor text for this is honestly pretty good. Oh yeah, I was a fan of the fact that one of the items is just exploding birthday cake, which that's the best weapon sure. in the game. Yeah, it's one. It's got a huge radius. It's great. Yeah, AOE does the most amount of damage. They give you them so frequently. One of the cool things that this game does, we we kind of we didn't get to touch on it yet, but it touches, but it deals with the weapons. There's a lot of secrets in these worlds where like you can find hidden areas, and usually in the last level of a world. The, if you find the hidden area, you find a specific hidden area, it usually gives you the weapons that you're going to get for the next world over. So the last level of huh. Prehistoric Plaza, if you find the hidden area, you can actually get cakes a level early. You can get, I want to say, toothpaste a level early as well. Um, you I can get all that. that. Yeah, it's that's how I found out. It's really cool, and that's when I discovered the beauty of cake. Uh, it just it ruins <laughs> everything in this game. But besides these specific weapons, one of the things that I think makes Power Pete unique compared to other kind of top down running gun shooters is that you get. I don't want to technically call them power ups. They're like a combination of a power up and a weapon. Where when you kill enemies, these items will drop on the on the ground. And there's usually just these little gray icons with a color, different color center. And depending mm-hmm. on what color center it is, determines some type of power up or like bonus attack or weapon or uh, a bonus perk that's usually temporary that will assist you. So, for example, if there's a blue icon in the center, that means every enemy on the screen freezes for. 30 seconds or like 10 seconds or something like that so you can kill them and get the collect the jawbreakers from them or you can just run right by them if it's red it unleashes a bolt of fire and it, it has all these flame wheels that go around if it's gray it create it essentially is like artillery he yells fire in the hole and shit starts blowing up everywhere uh, it's uh if it's yellow you get super fast if it's green you get a shield and there's all these really cool little they're not quite power ups cuz they're not te- they're not permanent but when you're playing the game and you're you know you're surrounded by a bunch of enemies there's nothing more satisfying than you're able to take one out and it's got a red it's got one of those red drops so you hit it and the fire wheel expands out and it goes in all directions and steadily pans out and all the enemies that are on top of you are pretty much gone from that one attack it's one of the most like viscerally satisfying experiences i've had in gaming Do, what are your thoughts on these kind of like power drops though it's nice it, it reminded me of something uh just for some reason the two things that came to actually the one that came to mind immediately was like arkanoid where it's like you just get random drops from the blocks you break and it's you just kind of roll with it it's like all right we got freeze what am i going to do with this for the next couple seconds all right i've got speed what should i reasonably do maybe i shouldn't go extremely fast into the next area uh yeah, it's 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 a nice touch. It's nice that it just kind of gives you these little things to pick up. Um, the weapons are a little more predictable. You kind of get those at a regular in- interval where like this level, you're going to get more of the musket. This level, you're getting more of the rocks. Again, that changes per world too. But yeah, I, I like it. I like having just kind of this little randomized element of like, hey, you're going to get a little thing. You got to take advantage of it while you can. Uh, just a nice little touch. The uh, I will say on the <laughs> I mentioned trying to play this on the original Macintosh version emulated earlier. Um, man, some of those things are inconsistent there, uh, especially if you're having <laughs> performance issues. The uh, the speed power up if you are running that game at full speed is very unwieldy, and that was the first sign to me where it was like this isn't right. This shouldn't be going as fast <laughs> as it is. Uh, it's the speed power up i think is actually one of the worst ones to get because it's so hard to control even even with the nice port that jorio did to modern uh computers it is still very finicky it is very hard to control and then you on top of that that magic funhouse level i was telling you about with like the air grates or whatever if you can outrun the camera sometimes or you can actually run against the air grates because you move so fast with the speed power up granted it's still only a temporary amount of time like a small amount of time so you're you, you can't like just completely you're not free to explore all those air grates that force you along but 
if you're strategic with it, or if you I should, I shouldn't say strategic, if you get lucky with a drop, you might be able to utilize it, depending on where it's dropped and whatnot, you might be able to util, utilize it to break the intended route that the developers wanted you to go on. But huh. I can't, I can't imagine that happening. Like that's, that's praying to the RNG gods to RNG Jesus and hoping that it works out. I think it's also a game that, and this is a good, I think, distinction between the older and newer versions of it. Um, the original version of Power of Pete has a much smaller viewing window. It's kind of this uh, smaller, boxier window. So if you get the speed power up, oftentimes you run into a room very fast and can't tell if there's going to be like, you know, 10 dinosaurs immediately bearing down at you as soon as you walk in. So it's just kind of a death trap as soon as you enter. Um, one of the nice things they added to the modern ports is that uh, obviously it's taking advantage of widescreen resolution uh, and just the fact that they can get more on the screen. So the play window is larger and you can actually see what's coming. And I found that that changed how I played the game. Uh, I think on the Macintosh version, it paid to be a little more cautious and kind of inch your way into mm -hmm. rooms and you really didn't want the speed power up. But I think and it's an, it's an interesting point of comparison to see the original version of the game versus sort of the enhanced version and I don't know. It adds a lot to it. I think another point in favor of just going right to the modern versions, if you are curious about this game, uh, just something as simple as making the window a little bit bigger, just I think hugely increases the playability of it. I never even thought about that, but you're right. Uh, expect, like, because, you know, you talk about how when game developers design games, they design it for specific experiences. You know, a lot of times people talk about, you know, like the five foot experience versus the one foot experience, you know, handheld and PC versus like home console type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I never would have really thought about this type of experience about the it's not really a, you know, one foot versus five foot experience, but a resolution experience, you know, how how much that can actually change the mechanics of the game, uh, not necessarily intentionally either. Uh, cause I, I even think back to like Mario and the handhelds where the, the screen was so much smaller, especially like, you know, Mario land two, where they had to completely, completely change the design around for it to accommodate for the less screen real estate. But I'm sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah. I think that's, what's interesting about Macintosh games, uh, in general. So, I mean, the Macintosh is stepping back for a second. Uh, like a lot of computer games at this point, DOS action games, let's say. The resolution was mm -hmm. usually like 320 by 200, maybe 320 by 240. So it was even blown up on the screen. You weren't getting the full resolution. It was a little pixely. Um, Macintosh could do like full 640 by 480 pretty well. So you had a combination of things. You had some developers would keep smaller sprites and just take advantage of the fact that they could fit bigger levels on screen. Or some developers would do bigger sprites, uh, which resulted in this still kind of limited screen space. And that's what PowerPeed does. You know, you have a big, yeah. chunky main character whose chin is like, I don't know, as big as like Mario's head on Super Mario Brothers NES. Uh, so that takes up more space. So I think it's interesting that it kind of comes around that, you know, 30 years later on the modern PC version, they are once again able to take advantage of, oh, we have more resolution. We can just get more of these bigger sprites on screen instead of trying to blow them up even further. Um, I think a more literal adaptation, I don't know. I could I could imagine like someone making a misguided Power Pete HD where these sprites all have the same relative screen size as opposed to like no like what didn't work about the game before is the fact that it had this very small viewing window let's take advantage of that and let the players see more in all directions mm -hmm. and i think that just I, I don't know it's it's interesting that the mac was kind of at an inflection point where it was like all right do you make the sprites bigger do you take advantage of the additional pixels uh and that that ended up mattering much much later on yeah i never really would have thought about that's really interesting now phil we are starting to get low on time so what i do want to ask you before uh, before we wrap up we still have a little bit more to, to talk about i figured we should list what our favorites were in these in this game and i i already mentioned before my favorite weapon was the was the cake the what do they describe it as exploding cakes yeah but i want to know about you what's you what was your favorite weapon in the game and then we'll go on and talk about our favorite levels I mean, likewise, the exploding cake of the toothpaste, uh, only because they, they were clearly getting weird with it. Uh, I think the other ones, you know, they have analogs like the gumball blasters are clearly shotguns. The flamethrower is a flamethrower. The suction cup gun is a gun uh, versus a toothpaste. Maybe the closest is like a short range laser that only works against enemies made out of sugar. Like it's I, I, I like when they got weird and specific in a way that kind of played with the toy dimension of the game. Mm hmm. 
I'm I'm with you on that. I besides the, besides the exploding cake, I also like the fairy dust. Like you were saying, there's specific things that are applicable to individual levels, and the fairy dust is specific for fairy tale trail. And like the toothpaste was good for candy cane lane. Fairy dust was good for fairy tale trail, and it really kind of worked. It really kind of took out the enemies easily there. That was also my second favorite weapon in the game. But besides weapons, be, you know, mm-hmm. some of them come from specific worlds. What is your favorite world that you did play on? Or I mean, you like you said, you didn't you never got to bargain bin, but based off what you did see of it, maybe that maybe that takes the crown for you. But yeah, you know, in your opinion, from what you've played, what were some of your favorite worlds or your favorite I, world? I mean, of other ones I played, I mean, I think the prehistoric one was the most well-rounded in terms of just having interesting level design and getting all the features out at once. I felt like it, it was well-rounded. I'm going to say that word again, but it was very well-rounded. Uh, but the the candy stage that came afterwards, I think I liked that one because it stuck the landing for me. Uh, again, I think there's a hesitation where I think a lot of games will uh, front load a lot of their interesting content. And I could imagine by the end, it's like, oh, shit, it's level four. What do we do? Uh, I don't know. Put some conveyor belts in it or something like that. But uh, Candy Cane Lane was different and distinct enough that it stood out to me as like these developers have different ideas in mind they want to execute in this game. So I'm I'm going to say Candy Cane Lane only because uh, I think that showed that it, you know, the first time I played this game as a kid, I only had the demo. I only had the first couple levels. I don't think I even finished all of the uh, the prehistoric levels. So seeing Candy Cane Lane for the first time, it was like, yeah, this isn't a one trick pony. There is more to this game. Uh, so I give it points for that. Yeah, I, I trying to think uh, for myself. I think I'd have to get actually, despite how much I railed against it, I actually like Magic Funhouse. <laughs> okay. I, I, th- I thought you were going to say the uh, the fairy tale uh, stage, no. all the, scre- all the screaming noises, which no, you, you should I, you should edit this podcast and just insert one of those screams randomly in the middle of this episode, <laughs> just, just to let scare everyone, my give listeners. Give them the power peat experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> i can that scream dude i can't get over it it's just nuts um that yeah no magic funhouse as much as i hate the second level i like the aesthetic of everything else with the clowns and uh, apparently we, we're fighting our way through a clown department uh as it that's the who, clown department right there yeah who works in the clown department is it a bunch of clown like do do they hire clowns like real like real people clowns to work in the clown department <laughs> <laughs> I, I i think i i'm trying to picture just like i don't know the the people what was i gonna say uh i feel like you often see people who are like oh i'd love to see like more like short stories exploring like you know the marvel world through the eyes of someone who's not a superhero <laughs> or something like that i want to see the story of the person who's hired to work at this toy store who's like yeah assigned to the cloud department and is forced to be in clown mode all day and that just doesn't sound i no one should have that job fanfic writers get on it we need to see power pete fan fiction i want i i want it sent to actually you know what maybe I, I don't want it sent to my dms i guarantee <laughs> the ao3 category for power pete does not exist <laughs> i'm gonna look this up as we're wrapping this episode up that's where the that's where the good stuff is these days yeah i hope there is a a power pete uh, oh my gosh i hope there's power pete fan fiction on archive ever and that'd be so funny uh <laughs> while you're looking that up we'll we'll start wrapping up this episode um <laughs> the well, last thing i want to say before we go into our plugs and our personal shout outs and all that good stuff is there i found this really amusing once again i'm i'm shouting out this this manual a lot i found it really humorous how they wrote it how it wasn't just some straight up you know like serious document they just they had fun with it just like they did with the game and how we kind of described mm-hmm. it the technical support section for for this manual if if your game isn't working and you need help from pangea soft this is what they say mighty mike was first released in 1995 and to be totally honest those of us who built this game don't really remember much in terms of where to find all the bunnies and how to get out of all the levels it's sad but true so we highly <laughs> recommend that you check out our website at pangeasoft.net slash mighty mike they will have information and links to other sites with helpful information on the game if, however, you have a question of technical nature and not related to gameplay, then please feel free to send your question to, and they provide an email address, which Pangea Soft, I guess, as a little button for this episode before our plugs, no, sadly, no longer exists. Um, but that's oh. not that recent. They actually went on to become iOS developers for a number of years. They, they publish a bunch of games on iPhone. 
And I want to say Pangea Soft only closed somewhat recently, at least from what I can see. Like Brian Greenstone, I don't even believe is even working. At, like I don't know if he's even on his like LinkedIn if he even includes it anymore. I'm going to have to double check it. Um, I mean, I, I assume Pangea Software as a functional entity was like one or two people at a certain like at a, at a certain point when you're a developer of that scale, you can kind of exist as long as you're interested in doing it. And like I, I was recently uh, researching an older Macintosh uh, game developer of uh, the name of which is escaping me right now. Uh, Delta Tau was the name of the developer and mm -hmm. their website is still up and they technically have a store. If you try to buy anything, the store doesn't work. If you email them, the guy will be like, yeah, sorry, store doesn't work. I, I don't know. But it's like the, the, the company exists in the sense that it's just the one guy who owns the rights to the game and still has the storefront up. That's, I mean, it's wild that stuff like that can even still happen. Like they, they, this, the things are up, but then no one knows how to work it. That's, that's just odd to me you end up you could end up in a bad scenario where you have something like um uh, one of the other big macintosh shareware developers in the era was ambrosia software did a lot of fascinating interesting uh colorful wacky psychedelic arcade game stuff for mac uh and they for a while you know they sold all their old games through their website uh, but for a while, the store was functional. You could, if I remember right, I heard that you could like still order things, but you wouldn't receive them. Uh, and Ooh. so it just got to a point where it was like this like dead store walking where it's like, well, technically you can buy the games, but eventually like the site's just gone now. I think I don't know how to get in touch with anyone there. So uh, I, I think, you know, maybe better to end on your own terms than just like let this get dragged out until it's, you know, some website that somebody is paying for after you die. Uh, so so good for I them mean, for uh, for ending on their own terms, I guess. I mean, the, to be clear, I this is still somewhat speculation because I, I, I remember reading it somewhere, but I can't find it. So then the website is still up, but the copyright on the website is only updated to 2015. So it's like this weird hybrid of like the it, everywhere that I can read, it still seems like they're still in business. But at the same time, they haven't really done anything on their website for the last eight years for almost a decade. So yeah, I, I, I don't it, really it, know. If it's just one guy, you know, the company only exists as long as they care, I guess. I'll look it up a little bit more, but um, I'm, I found Brian Greenstone's website. Ah, I'll, while we're talking, we'll, I'll look into it a little bit more. But in any case, um, let's wrap up this episode. Phil, thank you so much for joining me for, for this discussion on Power Pete. I know we had a little bit of a, a time limit due to some uh, unfortunate circumstances, but I'm very grateful for the time you were willing to give me here. And I, guess, I first yeah, uh, found I, you. Oh, I was going to say, ahead. everyone go get vaccinated this season. Uh, that is the reason why we have kind of a time limit on this episode right now. <laughs> Little under the weather as I'm recording it. So, And Phil's being a goddamn trooper, still recording an over hour long episode while getting over the flu uh, or something like that. So <laughs> for seriously, Powered man, Pete, absolutely. My God. You powered through for Powered Pete. <laughs> I mighty through for Mighty Mike. <laughs> I might. I'm going to use that now, and everyone's going to give me weird looks, and I'm kind of here yeah. for it. Yeah, it's a guy. I mighty through. It's like, what the fuck are I you talking through. about? That's not a word. <laughs> I really want that to be. I think we can. I think we can make that a thing. Starts um, here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I actually first discovered you through. You mentioned it before the uh, obscuratory, you, mm -hmm. specifically back in 2020 when you broke or when you were able to find a working version of sim refinery and then that, that really goodness. seemed to blow up for you if i remember correctly yeah you know i've been plugging away at the obscuratory for many years and i had an audience which i was happy with but um yeah once the sim refinery stuff and that was for the record that was the uh serious game developed by the people who made sim city maxis software they made it for the chevron corporation uh things really blew up at that point and so things have been on kind of an upward trajectory since then um Still hoping to get back to doing obscuratory stuff. I've just had a lot on my plate recently. Uh, I'm actually working on a book about Max's software, which, uh, boy, I have to actually write that thing. But um, well, uh, when you are ready to start publishing, let me know. I will have you back on to uh, help promote it. Well, check back in uh, some point in the future. I'm not going <laughs> to make any promises. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but otherwise, right now, uh, I'm trying to get back to streaming through the Obscuratory, so I'm frequently doing that at twitch.tv slash Obscuratory. But most of my energy right now is going to my work at the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, really encourage folks to follow us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamehistory.org. 
Uh, we always enjoy appreciate people's support as we're uh, exploring all these kind of interesting corners of how we're going to make video game history better. We've got some big things on our plate for the next couple of years. Uh, you know, we have this digital library we're working on that we're building up. We're going to have all sorts of cool behind the scenes resources from video games to share. Um, got some cool Mac game stuff. I haven't told anyone about yet because we haven't announced it. That's really cool. Uh, we've got, um, we are helping fight to change the law to make it easier for libraries and archives to provide access to their video game collections. We're working with folks from the Software Preservation Network to try to uh, try to actually literally change the law on this stuff. Uh, so we've got a lot of cool things we're doing. Uh, so if you want to stay tuned on what's going on with that, uh, yeah, check out what the Video Game History Foundation is doing. Always appreciate folks' support. Yes, I and I listened to your appearance on Retronauts talking about you and uh, it was you and Kelsey, I want to say on that. Yeah, Kelsey, Lou, um, yeah, we were on that one. Um, just talking all about the study that you that you guys did about how <laughs> uh, the how, how many games are lost. You know that that study uh, eight, was eight, just eight, wild. eighty-seven percent are out of print, and that was actually the Delta Tau one was why we were doing that for the study. One of the games in our random sample was this old Macintosh shareware game, and I had to email the guy and say are you selling this? He was like, well, not really. No. So I was like, all right, that game is out of print uh, <laughs> effectively. So yeah, uh, it's a mess, uh, but we are, we are trying the best we can to help fix the future. Um, and you guys are doing fantastic work and uh, Thank you. I, I'm really grateful to have you on for this and talk about power people, but also promote the game history foundation. It's something I'm super passionate about as well. I actually did a whole episode on game history myself, but it was pretty much just uh, parroting a lot of the stuff that Frank and Kelsey put up on the website about just, it was more or less to bring awareness to my audience than actually for me to come up with something original on my own. It was more or less just like I said, I want more people to care about game history and I, I, I try to share it in any way that I can. I appreciate um, it. Thank you. And it, it's funny over the last couple of months, uh, the study we did obviously got a lot of traction. So I've been doing a lot of interviews and podcasts about like, you know, why is game preservation important? So I was uh, almost burnt out on doing that. So seeing an invitation to talk about Power Pete, it was like, oh, hell yeah, let's take this hard <laughs> left turn into doing something totally different. Something that I guarantee you is not going to get me a lot of listens because no one cares about the very few, I should say, very few people know about this. But I I, uh, I love I love covering uh, like stuff like this. I, I don't care if people don't really know about it. To me, it's it's worth talking about. There's a wonderful quote from a friend and colleague, uh, Rachel Weil, that I want to quote here, uh, if I have it handy. Uh, probably a good note to end on where she said that one of the greatest powers of bygone video games lies in their ability to inspire the next generation. Keeping old games in a drawer is not enough. They have to be dusted off, booted up, played, enjoyed, discussed, and remembered. So, yeah, I think that's a good yeah. note to end on. <laughs> that's what we did here yeah so and for my own shout outs of course and before i go into the shout outs i did double check on brian greenstone's linkedin he still lists pangea software as active so even though nothing's been going on for it for almost a decade he's still he's still listing as active he also has a company called greenstone fine mineralia where he sells mineral specimens like fluorite and barite and aquamarine and calcite so that is a wild crossroads I, I i do love seeing what a lot of the software developers from that era would go on to do uh, my favorite i ever saw was i contacted a shareware developer who has since gone on to become a professional psychic it's like <laughs> oh sure okay you do you man you do you that's kind of awesome she but. was very nice uh just a big big unexpected left turn that's what a that's so cool actually uh but all right <laughs> For my own shenanigans, you can follow me on social media at Still Loading Pod on pretty much everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky, um, Threads, all that good stuff. Twitch, um, at Still Loading Podcast on YouTube. If you want to support the show, you can do so in a number of ways. You can give it a five-star rating or review on Apple Podcasts or whichever podcasting app you use. Like Podcast Addict has their own in-house uh, review thing. And that makes me feel warm and fuzzy. And I like feeling warm and fuzzy. And it, if... <laughs> If it's true that it pleases the algorithm gods, that it helps more people find the show, that would be also super – I'd be very grateful for anyone who drops a review, preferably five-star. Um, if you want to support the show monetarily, you can go to patreon.com slash stillloadingpod for a dollar a month. You'll get all the episodes a little bit early with uh, better audio quality as well as access to patron voting rights where you can help guide uh, future topics of the show. At the time this comes out, I believe one will have just ended and – 
uh or ended about a couple weeks ago actually and it was going to be on a psp game I, I asked my patrons to pick between four different psp games and that'll be another one i'm i'm covering so uh yeah patreon.com slash selling pod that you get all that for a dollar a month for for four dollars a month you get everything mentioned prior plus two mini bonus episodes a month uh and for five dollars a month you get everything i mentioned before plus access to still bonding which is my monthly james bond podcast where me and a few friends bond over 007 uh, uh, we, uh, uh i get it i get it yeah <laughs> uh where at the time this is coming out uh the most recent episode i think if I'm doing my math correctly, will have been either A View to a Kill or The Living Daylights is on its way out. So covering all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, that's over at patreon.com slash still loading pod. And then the final thing I want to mention is the Bit by Bit Foundation. The Bit by Bit Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to put video games and video game consoles in the hands of kids receiving inpatient care at hospitals. So if you want to support them, go to bitbybitfoundation.org and consider donating. And that is all the time I have for you on this episode of Still Loading. Phil, thank you once again, man, for joining me. Thanks for having me. And I will see you all next time.